According to the World Health Organization, mental illnesses account for 38 percent of all ill health in wealthier countries. A recent survey of 335 companies shows that mental illness has overtaken back pain and similar disorders as the biggest long-term health problem. 20 percent of us run the risk of being afflicted by one mental illness or another. That carries with it an economic and societal cost. Is that cost enough to inform politicians and business leaders on the needs of one discipline that could deliver solutions to our mental health problems, namely psychiatry? To help us understand what works and what doesn't work in the world of psychiatry, we welcome in New York, New York, Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, professor and chairman of psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is the author of Shrinks, the untold story of psychiatry. And with us back here in our Toronto studios, Jenny Carver, executive director of Stella's Place. Quam McKenzie, medical director at CAMH and the CEO of the Wellesley Institute. And Roger McIntyre, head of the Mood Disorders Psychopharmacology Unit at the University Health Network here in Toronto. And it is great to welcome Dr. Lieberman on the line from the Big Apple to you three. Nice to have you two back, Stella. For the first, thank you. We have Stella's place here for the first time. So, Jenny, Good to be thank, here. thank you very much for coming in as well. I want you three just to sort of get comfortable for the next little while because I'm going to do uh, basically some one on one here with Jeffrey Lieberman on this new book, Shrinks. The book, uh, Dr. Lieberman, is an account of how much psychiatry has changed from the time that you got into it to where we are today. Uh, I think you once described it as a psychoanalytic cult of shrinks that has changed into a scientific machine of the brain. What do you think has prompted this transition? Well, basically, uh, of the medical specialties, when medicine began to become really scientifically oriented, psychiatry was kind of the late bloomer, the runt of the litter, um, not because the people who, that pursued psychiatry were any less able and motivated, but because the brain and the areas of the brain that underlie behavior and mental functions was so much harder to understand and deconstruct. And it really didn't uh, come until the latter part of the 20th century that we had the tools and the uh, ability to gain some traction to, one, develop a more informed understanding of the underlying basis of mental disorders, and two, develop treatments that really worked and we could prove that by doing studies and providing the evidence. Give us a, for instance, an example of where this, this newfound focus on the brain would have paid dividends that might not have been paid years ago. Well, I mean, uh, in the 19th century, when medicine became scientific and the uh, sort of cutting edge methodology was anatomic pathology, you know, taking cadavers and looking at the organs and seeing where the pathology is, psychiatrists did this too, but they could find no footprints to explain why somebody had schizophrenia, why somebody was depressed, why somebody had autism. Um, and then Freud entered the picture in the latter part of the 19th century and filled this intellectual vacuum with a brilliant theory, but a theory that, one, was never verified through scientific experimentation, and two, had little relevance to what we call severe mental illness. And um, so psychiatry was guided by a non-scientific theory uh, which explained how the mind might function, but mostly pertained to the worried well as opposed to the mentally ill. And the first real breakthrough was the introduction of psychotropic drugs in the late 1950s and 1960s. And when antipsychotic drugs were introduced, like chlorpromazine or the first antidepressant, amipramine, not only did it work, but it gave psychiatrists kind of a foothold to begin to understand what do these pharmacologic agents do in the brain, what chemicals do they affect, what areas of the brain do they alter, that leads to the therapeutic response, and that was the beginning of a scientific understanding of these illnesses. Hmm. Let me ask you about schizophrenia, because that's your area of specialization. How much better are you and your colleagues today at diagnosing it than you were, say, 25 years ago? Well, we're much better, but uh, when you talk about contrast, I would say when I, when I was born, and I'm dating myself here, uh, 1948, um, there was no reliable way to say that you could diagnose schizophrenia. It was mainly a matter of opinion. It was like Potter Stewart's description of permography. I can't tell you what it is, but I know it when I see it. Um, but 
subsequent to the development of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and specifically the third revision of that orchestrated by Robert Spitzer in, uh, in the late 1970s, that was the first diagnostic system that was empirically uh, based and was reliable. The thing that's changed most over my professional lifetime is the fact that we have an understanding of what the actual causal basis is of mental illness, and we have an array of treatments, both pharmacologic as well as psychosocial, that are proven to work. And although they're not curative, they enable people who otherwise would have been relegated to an institution or intractable disability to lead functional and, in many cases, normal lives. Hmm. I do want to pick up on that delicious quote that I just uh, read a few moments ago, the psychoanalytic cult of shrinks that you wrote about, um, referring to psychiatrists of the past. Do you think there's any part of the so-called Freudian edifice that is still left standing? Absolutely. I mean, psychoanalytic theory was a brilliant theory. Uh, it still informs uh, the curriculum in medical schools and in uh, psychiatric training, and it is still used in practice, but it has become kind of a niche specialty that's used for people that, as I you know, kind of refer to them uh, glibly, the worried well, who have problems in living or want to get to know their sort of psychological makeup better, um, and have the money and the time to be able to you know, go to uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy several times a week for months or years. Uh, the title of your book is Shrinks, but I wonder, do you mind being called a shrink? I, I, actually, I think it's kind of derogatory, and it wasn't my title. I had a much more poetic sounding title, but <laughs> my editor says, look, do you want to write a book that appeals to your colleagues or that's going to cross over to a broader audience? And he says, this is what people think about when they think of psychiatry. Uh, I hate to say it, I think your publisher's probably right. But anyway, moving on. Let's talk about access here. And to that end, I'm curious as to, uh, as to how much one has to um, pay in order to get to see a psychiatrist in New York City in 2015. What's the hourly rate? Well, it varies. I mean, and, and it, it's unfortunate that given our countries, and, and, and in many ways over the years I've gained a, a severe case of Canada envy, <laughs> um, and uh, I know Canada thinks it lives in the shadow of the, uh, of the United States, but in reality it does so many things better than we do, including its health care system. Um, the U.S. health care financing system is uh, just appallingly dysfunctional, and as a result we have multiple s levels of care. You know, we have a concierge care for people that are very good private insurance or, or can pay out of pocket, um, and we have a more a standard level of care for people that have uh, more modest types of insurance and uh, managed care uh, 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 mechanisms uh, containing the cost of the services they receive. And then we have the public sector, which are receiving care through Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and uh, as a result of that, the, 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 the costs of services vary. But if you're talking about the top of the line, you know, the Park Avenue, the Central Park West, the Fifth Avenue psychiatrist who's seeing somebody mainly for medication or for psychotherapy, you're talking several hundred dollars, you know, three on the low side, maybe six or seven hundred mm -hmm. on the high side. Has the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare as everybody calls it, made it easier for a typical middle class American to have access to a psychiatrist? Um, somewhat but not a great deal because what it's done is brought more people into the, um, the uh, pool of patients seeking care, but at the lower end of the, what we call the payer mix spectrum. So uh, they're paying lower fees, and the reality is, is that the fees that are generally uh, uh, the, 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 the premiums, I mean, not the premiums, the benefits for mental health services um, generally don't cover the cost of a clinic that wants to deliver state-of-the-art care. Hmm. So what it does is it brings more people in needing care, which is good, because they think they have insurance and they're going to get care, but um, the providers, like myself, because uh, I'm the chair of a department, we have to kind of um, stretch our services to cover the volume because the reimbursement isn't enough to sustain 
uh, our business model uh, at the optimal level of staffing. Well, let me do one last follow-up on this. There was a piece in the New York Times recently talking about a 68-year-old psychiatrist who, I guess at the beginning of his career, used to see 50 to 60 patients, 45 minutes per session. Now he's got far more patients. He's got 1,200 patients now, and he sees them for 15 minutes, not 45, but 15 minutes per session, basically just to adjust their meds. Uh, can you comment on whether you think that's a, a positive development? Well, it doesn't sound like a positive development, but I think you, know, the, you have to look at it in a, in a larger context. So um, you, you mentioned at the outset in your, in your lead-in the epidemiology of mental illness. So conservatively speaking, 20% of the population will suffer a mental disorder in the course of their lifetime. You're talking about a lot of people. Uh, how, how, is, how is a country supposed to provide care? It needs a workforce and it needs to be able to provide uh, you know, support financing to get that care. Um, psychiatrists can't do it all because one, uh, there's not enough of them. Two, they're too expensive if you want that one-on-one -on -one treatment for, uh, you know, for 45 minutes. So there needs to be physician extenders, paraprofessionals, psychologists, nurse practitioners, social workers um, to work with psychiatrists. So it, it really, the, the old model, the, the private model, uh, I mean the model of the private practitioner, whether it was the GP or the psychiatrist, um, is really now becoming outmoded simply because of the fact that uh, uh, the financing of healthcare is changing, is requiring change, and the models of service delivery need to change. We're going to unpack much of that when we ask our other three guests to join our conversation. But in the meantime, let me ask you about how your impression of the public's perception of mental illness has changed over the course of the several decades that you've been practicing psychiatry. What's your sense of that? Well, this was, I think, a major motivator for me to write the book. So I, I've been in the uh, academic psychiatric world for 30 years. I've done mostly research and, and been active clinically treating patients. But as I got more involved in leadership roles, um, I became more and more concerned about the negative perception of psychiatry and mental illness, the stigma, the mistrust, the uh, uncertainty. And this was really a deterrent to many people seeking care who otherwise could have received uh, a lot of help from psychiatric treatment. So I wanted to try and cut through the stigma and the, the fog of misinformation by writing a book that would help to at least set the record straight with some credible information. And um, I think that in the United States and in, in North America, it's better than in other parts of the world, meaning that it's more acceptable to say you're re receiving treatment for a mental illness. Psychiatry is you know, talked about more openly, but it is still highly stigmatized, although not nearly as badly as, let's say, in Asia, where you know, the loss of face uh, for some family who has a member who has to acknowledge their have a mental illness is, is really uh, uh, life-altering. Let me do one follow on that because in spite of what you say, you also write in the book, the single greatest hindrance to treatment is not any gap in scientific knowledge or shortcoming in medical capability, but the social stigma. Have we still not made enough progress on this? Absolutely not. We have absolutely, categorically not. Um, you know, for many areas of medicine, for many diseases like ALS or ovarian or pancreatic cancer, uh, there are simply no treatments that are work that work, or, or Alzheimer's disease that work. You know what we need is a scientific breakthrough. Um, with mental illness, that's not the case. We have not perfect treatments, and they're not cures, but they work extremely well. The problem is, is we don't deliver them. We don't have them in positions in our hospitals, clinics, community health facilities, and people don't access these either because of lack of awareness, because of shame or embarrassment, or because uh, they can't afford them through insurance. So this is a public health problem. The, the, the analogy I would say is imagine if in Canada, you know, people were suffering from infectious diseases like pneumonia, um, tuberculosis, uh, 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 polio, uh, uh, AIDS, and, and they weren't getting treatment with antibiotics or vaccines or protease inhibitors or antiretroviral therapies because there was too much stigma, because they didn't know where to go, or because they weren't sure that these were really uh, effective treatments for these illnesses. That's what we have with mental illness. 
Let me ask you a couple more quick ones and then we'll get the other uh, guests involved as well. You know, there's no anti-oncology mov movement <laughs> when it comes to cancer. There's no anti-cardiology movement when it comes to heart disease. There is an anti-psychiatry movement. How come? Well, uh, that, that's, that's our dubious distinction as a medical specialty, the only one with an anti-movement. Um, why? Uh, well, in all candor, I have to say, in some cases, it was, at the time it evolved, which was in the 1960s, was maybe somewhat warranted, because at the time, psychiatry didn't have a lot to show for itself. Um, asylums were really appalling. They were overcrowded and bad conditions. Uh, there were really no effective treatments. The psychotropic drugs had just been discovered. And psychiatry was still very much in the throes of Freud and the psychoanalytic movement, which somewhat hubristically claimed effectiveness far beyond what the reality was. And so, you know, when Thomas Zaz wrote The Myth of Mental Illness and L. Rod Hubbard and Scientology teamed up with him to sort of start this anti-psychiatry movement, you could sort of see that uh, um, psychiatry uh, didn't have a lot to uh, defend itself with. But the problem is, is that was over half a century ago, and the situation has changed, and for the old attitudes to prevail is anachronistic and destructive. Has psychiatry changed enough to render those who, um, you know, still feel so much mistrust about your profession uh, on, the, on the fringes? It's changed a great deal. Uh, in, in, in many respects, the change is generational. Uh, people that have been trained more recently um, reflect the newer psychiatry and the newer approach. But the field, I would say, has changed so dramatically that anybody who has any uh, uh, inkling that they or a loved one or a friend has a, uh, a, a mental disorder that at least needs evaluation and possible treatment, they should not hesitate a bit to seek treatment. Okay, Dr. Lieberman, thank you for setting the table for the discussion to come. Let's now bring our other friends here, Jenny Carver and Roger McIntyre and Quam McKenzie into the conversation. I want to start with a, a kind of a hypothetical example that Dr. Lieberman gives in his book. Namely, you, you're, you want to go to a friend's wedding, you find out um, you can't go to your friend's wedding. Uh, what's the better explanation to give? Uh, I've broken my leg, I can't make it. I'm having panic attacks and anxiety and I can't make it. Uh, we're not in a world, Roger, where people will acknowledge the latter as a reason not to go. They're happy to say the former, broke my leg skiing, can't come. How far away are we from a world where somebody can admit, I can't come to the wedding because I'm having depression, mood, anxiety disorders, I'm sick, I can't come? You know, Steve, I'll pick up on that and, and I'll add to that. that if you went on a, uh, a date with somebody and that person was to say to you on the very first date, I'm taking an antipsychotic medication, um, I think they would react to that. And that's another example of the stigma. Appropriately so or inappropriately so? Well, I think inappropriately so. And I think that what we have, we have a stigma. Um, but I think, in fact, it would be also accurate to say, and I think Jeff made some reference to this, that I mean, things are changing. And they are changing in, 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 in a direction, I think, that is favorable. Now, what's the evidence of that? Well, in fact, we're seeing much more conversation publicly about mental illness. We're seeing the uh, public and private sector, the employ uh, employer sector, very much recognize the the implications of mental illness and in fact recognize the importance of providing some type of um, access and liaison to care. Uh, I also think that um, within the, um, the medical community, I think that there's even a, um, you know, less stigma around mental illness. And I think this is, uh, there's many examples of this. One, one that comes to mind is it's been amply documented now that having a mental illness not only represents a risk factor for developing many medical disorders like heart disease and diabetes, but it turns out that if we can actually, uh, in a timely and accurate way, treat, prevent the mental illness, this could in fact forestall even prevent the medical condition. Hmm. And there's a, a large body of evidence around this and so on. So I think we are seeing changes. I think it's directionally going where, where, where we want to go. And the, one of the words that, that Steve has was tools. We, we, we now have tools that are in a surreal way allowing us to look at the underlying causes, the underlying pathogenesis of these disorders, that I think the tool-based revolution will in fact really take us forward. And really I think it's gonna mitigate stigma even further. Hmm. Jenny, I mentioned off the top, we've never had anybody from your organization on the program before, so maybe 
Could you just give us the 30 second speech on what Stella's Place is all about? Absolutely. We are a community based organization that's totally focused on young adults, so 16 to 29 year olds. Um, and uh, sort of following up on your question, what we're trying to do is to support, to build a community where young adults feel totally comfortable, they feel safe, they feel connected with their peers, um, and they can also come and um, get whatever clinical services, wellness supporting services that they require is to the get focus back on, on track. Focus is on mood and anxiety disorders, mm -hmm. um, not exclusively, but that's going to be obviously the biggest cohort because that, those are the most, most common um, disorders. The other piece that's really important is that we have an online presence that we're building um, thanks to the uh, Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities. Um, and and what, what I think just in response to your question, what we're seeing with the community of young adults that we're working with is I think that they're much more open and talking about um, their mental health issues. They're, they're talking young about it more are. than we are. Honestly, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. they, they... Young people are. Young people are. They're, they're, they're texting about it. They're yeah. tweeting. They're on Slack. They're on, you know, they're using all these... Uh, What's Slack? Slack is a social media, sort of a texting program that you can download onto your phone and there's so much activity going on there. Young people are talking about what's going on and they want different things from all of us. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, yes, they want, you know, something to do in, to prevent their, their mental health issues, but they want information. They want to know what works. They want to be part of the discussion around what the menu of options is. They want to um, be part of the decision making. And here's the key uh, and question. And they're becoming experts on their own health. Who's Stella? Stella is a young woman who um, is, uh, was the reason that Stella's Place came to be. Uh, her issues came up during high school and she kind of went off the rails and it was very, very challenging for her and her family to support her. They found this gap, <laughs> the huge gap between um, child and youth services and adult services that really doesn't respond to what this young crew or the young adult crew need. Adult services are scary um, and you get to line up a long time to get what you need. So Stella had um, multiple issues around um, mood disorder, substances, all kinds of stuff went off the rails and now it's doing really well. But they went through looking for treatment and found it so frustrating that they realized they needed to do something to help others. So that, that's the commitment of, of Donna Green and her daughter Stella. So that's where we started about three years ago and now we have a community of young adults and we're gradually building uh, the pieces that the young adults, we're co-designing the program with young adults. Gotcha. So. Quam, the future of psychiatry, does it depend on what we think about mental health and mental illness? The future of psychiatry is a difficult one because uh, I'm a practical guy and I think the future is linked to whether we're relevant and I think the biggest relevant issue at the moment is people getting treatment. One third of people who have mental health problems don't get treatment at all and uh, those that do some of them get effective treatment and some of them get treatment that isn't that effective. So I think we're going to have a future and be relevant if we increase access to care or if we can do something to decrease people's need for care, either by working with other groups such as Stella's Place or uh, increasing people's resilience so that they don't need our services, or by giving people self-help skills so that when things start going wrong, they can try and uh, be their own doctor. Is this stigma business uh, very much a generational thing? Older generations just still have a tough time acknowledging mental illness, younger generations less so? I think that there are differences across the generations and so there's a lot more talk and discussion about mental health problems uh, in younger groups and actually I'm finding now in the increasing geriatric population or older population we're finding people much happier to talk about mental health problems as well uh, because they're so common but I think we have to be careful about uh, thinking about which mental health problems. So there's quite a lot of evidence to show that uh, the dial is turning on stigma for anxiety and depression and the dial is turning the opposite way for schizophrenia. Hmm. How and, come? Well, people, it's one of these things that people say that the more that uh, we've been looking at the biological causes of schizophrenia, the more people have been saying, well, this is genetic, this is something fundamental, this is something you can't change. And so, you know, this is something I'm not that interested in. And so people start, a stigma seems to be linked in part in the uh, increasing uh, evidence of some sort of biological factors 
involved in uh, schizophrenia. Let me pick up on that. I want to go to Jeffrey Lieberman in New York again on that. Do you think we're getting closer to a situation where, as Dr. McKenzie just describes it, we're we are seeing more biological markers for various mental illnesses rather than just sort of having to take a doctor's professional uh, experienced opinion for these things? Well, that, that's the goal. I mean, that's, uh, that's where scientific, uh, a lot of scientific uh, research is, is aiming for. Um, I mean, if you look at all of medicine, all of medicine proceeds in the same fashion uh, to characterize an illness and come to terms with how to treat and cure it. So the first level of description, whether it's infectious disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, uh, respiratory, uh, auto, uh, uh, rheumato rheumatologic, is describing the symptoms. Um, you know, what does it cause the person to feel and do? You know, uh, congestive heart failure used to be called dropsy uh, because people would have edema, you know, their fluid dropped to the bottom of their body. Uh, diabetes uh, was diagnosed by tasting the urine. Uh, if it was sweet, it was called mellitus. If it was watery, it was called insipidus. But then when biochemical tests were developed to measure glucose in the blood and hemoglobin A1C, and the EKG was developed to measure heart function and so forth, um, there was a diagnostic test that could function to confirm the symptomatic diagnoses. And then the next step was to determine what's the underlying etiology. Is it an infectious agent? Is it a metabolic problem? Is it uh, you know, uh, neoplastic from cancer? Um, Psychiatry has never been able to progress beyond the symptomatic basis of diagnosis, but the goal is, is to have imaging, EKGs for the brain, blood tests to measure analytes that can confirm clinical diagnoses. And uh, genes will, I think, ultimately be among the most uh, powerful means of what I call peeling the diagnostic onion. Hmm. Quim. Yeah, I think that uh, we've just got to be a bit careful because uh, sometimes there's a bit of confusion, uh, the difference between cause and mechanisms. So say for instance, something awful happened, I had a heart attack here at the moment. Uh, the mechanism might be that my artery gets clogged by fat. That's not the cause, that's the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And my heart stops and I fall down. The cause is something to do a bit with my genetics, a bit with the amount of exercise I keep on saying I'm going to do and don't do, a bit with uh, diet, the stress, smoking. a bit with diet, yep. a bit with... So the causes yeah, but, 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 and yeah, but, but if, the if, causes if, if, and the mechanisms sometimes get confused. Now I'm absolutely. not saying that this is, uh, you know, it's incorrect to have biomarkers for the mechanisms. That can be useful, but I think if we need to be thinking holistically, we need to go a bit further. From an infectious disease perspective, okay. you wouldn't think about having a just uh, using antibiotics. You might ask about stop people. You may say, "Well, why don't you wash your hands?" Eh? And so you have to be thinking a bit further than the individual. Let's get Jeffrey Lieberman to respond to that, and then we'll get uh, Roger in after that. Well, I completely agree with Dr. McKenzie. But look, um, if your heart attack is due to arterial our arteries being clogged because of cholesterol or you know a, a an indulgent diet um, versus having some type of vasospastic phenomenon or what's called broken heart syndrome you know which is stress induced um, an EKG is still going to be able to diagnose it for you uh, imagine before they had EKGs or even uh, um, a stethoscopes if somebody complained of chest pain and you examine them, you'd have to determine is this, a sh is this you know, a heart attack? Uh, is it uh, um, you know, just dyspepsia, acid reflux? Um, is it some kind of uh, respiratory infection in which the chest wall is affected? Uh, so this was what psychiatry is doing now. It's trying to make these determinations based on limited information of you know, clinical symptoms. But the EKG enabled people to get a measure which was more definitive. Um, the same thing with many other tests that are currently used. So, so these are not mutually exclusive. They're simply enhancing our level of precision and, and confidence. Roger McIntyre. Yeah, I think that there's a um, you know, need to highlight that there are um, mechanisms that may lead to disease, more distal mechanisms like childhood adversity, more proximate mechanisms that, you know, that uh, Kwam's pointing out in terms of vasospasm and so on. 
I, I think, in fact, what we're really talking about now is more convergence. And the word convergence and a convergent scientific framework to psychiatry. In order for us to have disease-modifying curative treatments, it begins with understanding the basic neuroscience, subserving these conditions. And we're going to continue to be in a scenario where we're going to be symptom-based, so-called phenomenologically based, without really understanding the underlying process. Now, the issue of stigma comes into this in part, but part of this is also political. Um, June 5th of 1981 was the first time a person in the United States was diagnosed with HIV AIDS, a condition we can agree was highly stigmatized. So to make the case that stigma is the principal barrier to progress in psychiatry wouldn't hold water because, in fact, HIV AIDS went from a death sentence in the 80s and 90s to a condition we talk cure today, chronic disease declared two years ago by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So the words cure can be used in the same sentence as psychiatry. Disease modification can be used in the same sentence as psychiatry. But we will not have that until we actually have a, clar a clarity on the underlying neurobiology with full recognition that the pathway to this convergence could be through a variety of cultural and social and biological factors and economic factors, but what is that convergence pathology? And so the theme, the motif going forward in neuroscience, the convergence, and where is that convergence? Jenny Carver. I, I, so there's know, a lot I, of doctor I, talk. Stand by, Dr. Lieberman, go ahead, There's Jenny. a lot of doctor talk here, but I guess what, what comes up for me is, um, how do you make sure that you've, you've got lots of work to do with the brain, the brain science, the neuroscience, the sorting out why this is happening, how you can then create treatment. Uh, but in the meantime, you've got young adults, lots of them, half a million in Ontario with mental disorders who are saying, give me my information. I want to know what the evidence is <laughs> and I want you to help me plan my care. I want to, you, I want to know that I can trust mm -hmm. uh, the information you're giving me. Um, so there's a disconnect between all the work that's going on behind the scenes and what an individual person coming saying, yeah. I need your help. <laughs> um, yeah, I need to know that I can trust that the information you're giving me is going to make a difference and I want to be in charge of my own health care. So, uh, you know, I think, I think we need to think about the prevention science, the implementation of knowledge that you guys are doing a good job of, of, uh, of developing, but it's not getting out to where people are so that they can have a confidence that there's a menu and that they can take charge of their health. Quam, quick follow-up? No, I agree, because I think the fundamental science and the fundamental neuroscience is very interesting, very useful. Uh, I don't think we're there yet in knowing enough uh, to really change a huge number of our cures. But the thing that becomes frustrating from a, for a lot of people is the fact that we actually do have, as Dr. Lieberman was mentioning, some really good uh, therapies uh, some of them are uh, drugs, but a lot of them aren't. We have mindfulness, we have cognitive behavioral therapy, we have lots of different therapies out there that work really well. Hmm. And for me, I'm interested in a bit of balance. So some of the neuroscience, some of the cognitive science, and then some social science, hmm. so we can actually decrease the number of people who get ill. And so I, I just want balance, and I think we can call it convergent science, mm -hmm. but it's uh, getting a bit of balance out there. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, Jeffrey Lieberman, talk a bit about uh, early diagnosis, because I, I think one of the statistics we used earlier in the week was that 75% of adults with mental illness develop their first symptoms when they're in their teen years or early 20s. Are you able nowadays to diagnose those folks with a mental illness earlier in life, in, and presumably, therefore, will have more success in treating them? Well, the short answer is yes, uh, but it's a work in progress. But if you'll allow me, I just want to go back to the earlier uh, point. Um, so Roger's, Roger's comments, I think, was a brilliant, uh, really, uh, characterization of the current state and the optimal path forward. We're really talking about convergence of psychodynamic and uh, neurobiologic uh, disciplines and lie and sources of information and that is where ultimately uh, the most effective way of elucidating these things and developing treatments for them will come the problem and I hear it in both Jenny's comments and in dr. McKenzie's comments is that there's a sense of sort of suspicion mistrust wariness and territoriality like uh oh uh, the neuroscientists are coming in. Pretty soon a psychiatrist will just look at x-rays, read laboratory numbers, read EKGs, and ignore a patient and their life and their circumstances. 
That's not the case at all, and it shouldn't be the case. You know, there was a chairman of uh, Yale in the 1960s, Morton Reiser, and he ruefully commented that as psychiatry was coming out of the psychoanalytic era, that for the last 50 years, psychiatry has been brainless, and now we're going to be mindless. <laughs> and um, I think uh, Roger used the term convergence. The term I used in the book is pluralistic. And so it's good news. It's not bad news. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. Jenny? Well, I think the, whether you call it pluralistic psychiatry, whether you call it convergence, what we're talking about is collaborating with our um, partners in the health professions and also with peers who have gone through um, a lot of the concerns that each of these young person, people is, is uh, dealing with who can offer some lived experience and advice around actually strategies. They can totally understand what someone is going through. But all the, the language of convergence is really about integrating care, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thinking about who needs to be there to do the diagnosis, mm -hmm. who needs to be there to, to assess, who, who's got the best tools. Um, whether it's pharma, whether it's CBT, mindfulness, and how to then pull that together so that it makes sense for the person. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can each talk about what we do best, but the point is that the individual there is going to need a number of things to support their whole health. And what we're hearing from young adults is they want that kind of a comprehensive look at who am I, not just one piece of me. They don't want to be car compar compartmentalized. Um, they want to see comprehensive whole health service. And, um, that's what convergence and, and uh, pluralistic psychiatry is really all about, but that's your term within your profession. We talk about collaborative integrated care, <laughs> comprehensive assessment, treatment, um, same, same story. Mm -hmm. But how do we do that and how do we make sure the right person is doing the right stuff? I think in many ways we're, we're really in fact using different descriptors to, to really think, you know, describe a similar concept. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I purposely use the word convergence. I think in, in, you know, we're seeing not just convergence in terms of the different pathways to uh, brain illnesses. These are brain illnesses. But also convergence from the point of view of both mental and physical. And this is an important point I, I, want, I want to underscore. It, you know, uh, we, we, the, the, the worldwide economy is shifting. It's shifting from a primary economy to a brain-based economy. It's shifting to a human capital-driven economy. And so the implications of brain capital are enormous. The biggest debaser of human capital, if you can say it that way, is mental illness. And so we want to preserve brain function, but we also want to keep people alive. So you know, in the early 1900s, 1910, the average lifespan of an American citizen was 51. Hmm. Today it's 79 to 80. And kids yeah. born today are going to live to 100. Yeah. True, but if you have major depression or bipolar or schizophrenia today, you're lucky to see your 55th birthday. Huh. So there's an overrepresentation of chronic medical illnesses in these individuals as well, which is killing them. And the gap between those who don't have mental illness and those who do vis-a-vis -vis their, their physical health is, even, is widening even further. So not just convergence of neuroscience in that, in that sense and convergence of systems, but also convergence of the physical and the mental in order to bring about health outcomes Absolutely. that we want. Quinn. Yes, I mean, it's an interesting concept uh, because what tends to happen when we're thinking about mental illness or physical illness is a lot of the things we do is we think about the individual. And so we think of the neuroscience of the individual. Uh, and the reason why it might sound a bit defensive and a bit like it's, I'm, fe I'm feeling, uh, just a second, this isn't quite right, mm -hmm. is because the public health approach isn't always about the individual. And social science is al isn't always about the individual. It's about changing the circumstances that the individual is in. So if we look at schizophrenia, if you have uh, a diagnosis of schizophrenia and you have an identical twin, that twin has 50% chance of developing schizophrenia even though they've got the same biology. Hmm. Now some of the choices are whether you focus on the biology or whether you focus on the social circumstances. They're different. They have to work together and be understood together, but n nothing is better than the other, really. And if you're really going to make a difference on the rate of illness, you're probably going to do that through uh, social means uh, rather than, and treatment rather than uh, the neuroscience, which yeah. I think we have to do because it's really important. I think we have to understand it because it's really important and I'm a 100% supporter. I just think that there needs to be a bit of balance there uh, because at the moment, uh, I think that sometimes we overstate what we can do with the neuroscience and we understate what the history of medicine really is, which is that the big changes have tended to be in pub 
due to public health, due to sanitation, due sure. to good uh, education, due to good food. And we, we, we just need to mix it up. I, I'm a full on supporter of neuroscience as part of a balanced diet. As part of a balanced diet, gotcha. Yeah. I want to circle back with Jeffrey Lieberman to something we talked about near the top of the program, and that is the notion of whether or not there are going to be enough of folks who do what you do in the future. I think about half the psychiatrists in the United States today are over the age of 50, and I wonder whether you see a supply crunch coming in the decades to come. Well, I think the good news is, is that uh, there's a very rich talent pool of um, medical students or, or people who want to go into the healthcare professions that are interested in, in behavior and, and, and sort of brain uh, areas. Um, the problem is, is that the uh, economic macro environment and the constraints that are being placed uh, on government support for training as well as healthcare are limiting the supply, so we've got a bottleneck. So we, we need, so we need more primary care doctors. And we've got plenty of plastic surgeons and cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, we also need more psychiatrists, and we need more geriatric and child psychiatrists. But the, trainings, the, the training programs are not being expanded. Um, and that's something in which you know, the government making, is making a decision based on economics, keeping the GDP uh, cost or amount of uh, spent on health care down. Um, and then the other thing is, is okay, uh, if, if you want to build a health care system that provides the best quality of care to the uh, largest proportion of the population in a cost-effective way, um, what, what are the different roles that the different health care professionals should play? You know, we have like an anesthesia or an OBGYN, midwives and nurse anesthetists, and we've got um, uh, other types of physician assistant and nurse practitioner, physician extenders, we need to have these built into systems of care in psychiatry too, as well as, as Roger was saying, the integration of um, healthcare providers into primary care and medical specialty and, uh, services. So the problem is, is our governments do not think about this in an enlightened way and uh, because of the political gridlock, even if they did, who knows whether they'd ever be able to get support for this. So as a result, uh, us healthcare providers uh, are sort of thrashing about you know, trying to make do when our knowledge is enabling us to do much more than, than we actually are, 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 are able to. Roger, I'd like you to follow up on that and in doing so, I want to put a couple of statistics on the table first. Ontario Children's Mental Health Report. 6,000 kids waiting for psychiatric services in the province of Ontario today. That number is expected to double by next year. Talk to us about supply and demand in psychiatry right now. Well, those are dire numbers. I mean, those are alarming. Um, and um, the fact is, is that uh, there will not be enough psychiatrists anytime in the near future. Um, and I uh, agree with, with, with Kwam's point about the, really the, the tilt towards the pivot towards the prevention and the preemption. Um, uh, and, and I think, in fact, there are a number of uh, low-hanging fruit opportunities. Let me just uh, hi highlight one. Everybody knows that if you have diabetes, common condition, common to young people, unfortunately, becoming more common, that there are consequences, what we call end organ damage. There's problems with your, your heart, there's problems with your vision, there's problems with your peripheral nervous system. Uh, what is also well known is that there's, there's also brain consequences. You have a much higher rate of depression, a higher rate of other psychiatric disorders like Alzheimer's disease. And there is, in fact, several lines of evidence that are suggesting to us that if we can really well control the diabetes, we can prevent the onset of the mental illness altogether. Hmm. So there are already plenty of lines of science out there that would empirically support the assertion that we can prevent depression, we can prevent mental illness. But that's an upstream solution, that's not upstream. a downstream. That's upstream. So in, so in the short term, I think what we're looking at is, is we're going to be looking at engaging our primary care partners, engaging allied health professionals. We haven't said a whole lot about e-technology. I think e-technology can be our friend in this, in this space. Uh, for example, mobile phone technology is a way of bridging uh, communication with uh, anemic supplies of care providers, as well as using various forms of telephony, internet, and so on as a way of engaging the system. Uh, this is 2015, it will be an e-future, and I think that in the short term, along with uh, engaging our primary care partners, is going to be 
the short-term solution. Jenny, then Quam on this issue of the future supply of psychiatrists. I, I'm interested that the question is about the future si uh, uh, supply of psychiatrists when I think there are lots, I think uh, Jeff was referring to the, the service models and that we need to think differently about, um, about service models and right now um, it's, th there are no uh, funding, there's no public funding through our national health plan for other than psychiatry medical professionals unless you're working in an outpatient service. Mm -hmm. So you know, I wonder if something comes into play around how we are funding um, and how the policy is developing around what services can be accessed uh, for a period of time by, uh, from um, allied health professionals who are able to provide mm -hmm. evidence-based treatment. Yes, they need to consult with a psychiatrist perhaps around some particular mm -hmm. you know, intricacies, specializations when things get complex. But I wonder if we're really thinking about other allied health professionals that can come in and do um, you know, a, a fair amount of the work um, that, it, that we know is evidence-based, and in some cases as, is as powerful and impactful as uh, Cyclopharm. Okay, Roger, uh, quick comeback, then Quam. Stand by, stand by, one at a time, hang on, one at a time. We got Roger, just, then Quam, then Jeffrey Lieberman. I just want to put a call out to the employers across the country, uh, public and private, small, medium and large. Canadians with mental illness are impaired in the workplace. Employers across the country are interested in being partners with us. Are they going to be the most responsible care provider? Probably not, but certainly in the short term can also help in the integrated access to care for many of our, our persons. Yeah, and, and I think that's completely reasonable. There are people with insurance who could uh, do what happened in the UK where uh, Professor Layard from the uh, London School of Economics said, uh, I think it must be 10 years ago, that we needed 10,000 cognitive behavioral therapy specialists to keep people at work. Huh. And that was what that was the thrust of British mm -hmm. policy. One of the things that I think I'm really glad you said, Jenny, was this idea that at the moment we pay the professional rather than pr pray for the evidence-based treatment. And so you can go to a professional and you can have five day a week. If you go to a psychiatrist, you can have five day a week uh, psychotherapy um, at uh, on OHIP. If you go, yeah, we should just say for Jeff. Sorry, which the is Ontario, Ontario Health, Health Insurance Plan. Uh, which you can get. You can get that. That's on OHIP. If you go to a psychologist for cognitive behavioral therapy in the community, you have to pay for it out of pocket. What's the alternative? Well, there's a question. There, there, there are a few things. There was one more thing I wanted to say about mm -hmm. the psychiatrist, so, which is we actually in Ontario have a lot of psychiatrists. So why do we have such long waiting lists? Because we have a lot of psychiatrists who in private practice who rarely see new patients. Ah who have seen the same patients for years and years. There's a wonderful paper by Paul Kurdiak from uh, the Institute of Clinical Evaluators Science uh, in uh, Ontario who took all of the data and looked at all the billing and was able to show how many psychiatrists are in private practice seeing the same patients they've seen for many years and no new patients. Mm -hmm. And there's a question about if we want to use our resources properly whether that's can, the way we want to go. Can, can, Jeffrey can, Lieberman, can, come on can, in. Can I, can I make a comment? Uh, I, I'm, I'm really disappointed at the uh, direction that the discussion has turned. I, I didn't do my homework and get uh, briefed on who everybody is. I'm guessing Dr. Pinder is a psychiatrist. Jenny is a, um, is a peer advocate or uh, in an allied mental health discipline. And Dr. McKenzie is a psychologist. Is that right? No. <laughs> well, no. Okay, let's try again. Uh, well, what, 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 what's Dr. McKenzie's discipline? Me, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, but I'm, psychi an I'm an evidence-based psychiatrist. So, okay. so, I, so, so I, I, I think, I think what, what I'm hearing is that let's get the doctor out of this, and the doctor in this case has to be the psychiatrist, and uh, psychiatrists should never be minding their in income more than they're minding their responsibility as physicians to take care of patients. So. If, if you can have a nice, cushy private practice taking care of you know, the worried well and seeing the same stable of patients forever, good for you. You, know, you could have become a plastic surgeon. You could have gone into business to make, make money. Um, but if we're trying to create the best mental health care system to help the most people who suffer from any type of mental illness, it's not a question of psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker, nurse. Uh, lay therapist, um, occupational therapist. It's a question of how do you meet the population need in a cost-effective way based on the best science. And in some instances, you'll have to have the psychiatrist do it. I mean, if you want to have organ replacement or joint replacement, you're going to have a surgeon. 
and no one else can do it. Now maybe the technology will ultimately do that. So the, you know, it's interesting, and this is the last thing I'll say and I'll be quiet. Um, yeah. I was having a discussion the other day with uh, some health policy people. And the common refrain is that our healthcare system is broken. It doesn't work. Too many people aren't getting treated or falling through the cracks. You know something? If a congressperson or a president said, what do you think would be the best system, we don't have one. There has not been a serious and really enlightened effort to define what the best system of public mental health care would be and what the roles and responsibilities in terms of the, uh, uh, the workforce, the, the uh, roster of professionals that would be employed to do that are. Um, but it's not going to be exclusively the psychiatrist. It'll only be the psychiatrist doing what they have to do. Okay, with just a few minutes to go, I know yeah. you all want to respond to that, so go Perfect. ahead, Graham. So they did actually do this work in the UK, and they tried to look at who was best at doing what and who was cost effective. And they also set up the National Institute of Clinical Excellence to do exactly the same thing. I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a proud psychiatrist, and I'm uh, proud that the psychiatrists who work with me are excellent. Um, my question is all about, in Ontario, how best do we use the resources we've got? And there's a question. I actually want those psychiatrists in private practice to see more patients, not fewer patients. I don't want to get rid of psychiatrists. I want to open up, but I do want to open up access to cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness therapy because it works. And if we can do it cheaper, that's great. And I'd then like the psychiatrists to see more complex um, uh, patients because they're doctors. So I'm sorry if uh, Dr. Lieberman got the wrong end of the stick, but we're both talking, I think both me and Jenny are not talking about getting rid of psychiatrists. Yeah. We're talking <laughs> not at all. Use people want <laughs> access to psychiatrists and we want the right people to get access to the right psychiatrists so that they can get better. Uh, psychiatry is incredibly important. We're one of the most powerful uh, professions with regards to getting people better. We do it very well. Roger? Yeah, I think the model, going back to what I said, uh, Steve, is uh, I, I would see the model, the framework in the short term is the primary care provider broadly defined as being the, the centerpiece of this. We do not have enough uh, uh, psychiatrists who, have, uh, who are available to see the patients in a timely fashion. And so I see the psychiatrist in a consultative role uh, in, uh, in most cases, in some cases more of a primary care role for that patient, but more of a consultation role as part of what we call a medical home, an integrated model that's not only paying attention to the physical aspects but the psychosocial aspects of our patients. So I think that's the realistic model. It's already occurring. The, uh, the, 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 the organization that oversees family physicians in this province has already has a, uh, an OHIP supported program that's dedicated to try and achieve this best practices, maybe not evidence-based practice, but best practices. And I think that's the realistic short term. Okay, let me save a minute here for Jenny. Just a, a quick point about young adults and this huge uh, wave in numbers of young adults who are in distress, who where their disorders are beginning, we're beginning to uh, go into the developmental period that's a struggle, and we got to shift something. This is a sea change we need here uh, to respond to the needs of these kids who are not staying in, certain, in treatment, they're not getting to treatment, so something's got to change, something's got to give. What does that mean we got to shift something? Well, I, th I think we have to begin to listen to young people and have them drive. Th these young people know exactly what they want. Ye yes, they know they need some a good assessment, a good diagnosis, and a good plan. But they they also know they're not prepared to to be uh, you know marginalized, uh, compartmentalized, taken into pieces. They want to be in charge of their care. They want to make decisions. They want to be given the information so that they can be re responsible for their a care. And that is the last word on this program. Thank you, everybody. The last word for the week two of our Mysteries, Mysteries of the Mind series. Uh, let's thank Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman for being there on the line from New York City for us. His new book, once again, shrinks the untold story of psychiatry. He hates the title, but it'll sell well. Let's also <laughs> thank Jenny Carver, the executive director at Stella's Place, Quam McKenzie, the medical director at CAMH and CEO of the Wellesley Institute, and Roger McIntyre, the head of the Mood Disorders Pharmacology Unit at the University Health Network here in Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.